welcome back to the Tree of Life podcast. My name is QB May. This is Jacob Todson. Uh, we're going to be talking to you today about the Celtic and the Nordic traditions and pagan traditions of spring, the season that's coming up, the beautiful things that are arriving for the month of April. And we're also going to approach the topic, the little dodgy topic of shamanism. Yeah, so our kind of idea for this podcast is since we're releasing it, our goal was like once a month, is we kind of want to give you like almost like seasonal updates. Uh, this is something I think Kubi and I are both really big on, mm-hmm. is this idea that paganism is a very seasonal practice and it's very much reflective of your natural world. So we're both going to kind of talk about our relationship to these natural worlds. Uh, and, you know, obviously we're in the same spot right now if you're watching this on video. Uh, if you're not, I am in Glastonbury at the moment, and I will be for the next month, so we'll probably record a couple of episodes here, and so we can kind of reflect on the season as it is here, but um, as I travel around, we can reflect on the season as it's different around the world. Uh, so that's kind of the idea, uh, but yeah, and then we're going to be talking about shamanism as well, so lots to talk about today, but first mm. we wanted to tell you what we're doing, because we have some stuff coming up. So mm. Kubi, what do you have coming up here? So, at the beginning of May, just a few days after Beltane, which is a great time to come to Glastonbury, where there's huge celebrations uh, across the town, uh, I am hosting my Celtic Shamanism Retreat. It's a four-day retreat, and we're exploring the the healing practices of our ancestors, um, and it results in a Celtic healing certificate. I'm so excited to be teaching this one, and it's just surrounded by glorious countryside, and we're joined by Katie, uh, Havoc, as she used to be known as, as she's amazing cook, beautiful uh, vegan and vegetarian food. Um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of there for the food, as well as That's for half the, the reason teaching. I got to treats, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, please, uh, the link will be below if you do fancy coming along. Uh, we're going to be accessing lots of crazy trance states and making herbal concoctions and tinctures and connecting with the old gods on the land, doing lots of cool rituals. So come along, yay! Excellent. Uh, yeah, so like uh, what I'm doing, uh, so I have two things I want to kind of tell you about. Uh, I have a huge project I've been working on for a while. Uh, basically, as soon as I got to Scotland this year, I have been working with uh, three people, uh, all who are heavily invested in the identity of Scotland, and I've been recording interviews with them and have been editing myself to death on this video. Um, that's uh, It's about 25 minutes long, but it's kind of ended up as this like mini documentary. Um, at the moment, I'm calling it uh, Scotland's uh, Fading Identity. Because mm-hmm. it really is about the fact that Scotland, uh, like so many places in the world, have lost, uh, you know, dare I say, like the indigenous viewpoint. Um, you know, everywhere was indigenous at one time. It's one, of, one of the things I was actually taught by a shaman from a Native American tradition is we were all indigenous. Mm. Uh, we've just lost our way. And some people more recent than others. Uh, and that's always been a very powerful statement. And Scotland definitely has lost its identity recently, uh, actually within the last 200 years. So this video really much uh, explores the loss of Scottish identity and what that identity could have been and how it still survives today. So uh, sadly, I was going to show Kubi today, but I forgot my laptop. But it's really cool. Uh, it's I saw a snippet of the trailer, actually, on your last video, and I was like, oh, that looks good. Yeah. It's going to be juicy. No, it's, yeah. it, there's no reason someone that doesn't have an editor should be doing this. <laughs> like, it was so much work. Uh, but that will be coming out Saturday the 13th of April, I believe, uh, at like 9 a.m. U.S. time. So really looking forward to it. Uh, again, this video has taken, I've never put this much work into a video. Uh, this is the way I want the YouTube content going moving forward is I want to do these longer things, these bigger projects, these bigger ideas. Uh, so the only way that's going to happen is by having people watch it. And so I really hope you turn up for that and enjoy it and share it and uh, know it's something I'm truly passionate about. And uh, the people I worked with on that project were incredible. Uh, but the last thing I'll say is I also have a shaman circle coming up, like a healing circle in uh, the last weekend of May. Uh, It has a few spots left open, and what we're going to be doing is exploring the spiritual animals of ancient Scotland. Oh my god. Yeah, so we're going to be doing the Pictish animals. So there's like 13 different known Pictish animals that were carved into stone, and we're going to be doing uh, guided meditations and trans journeys to connect with them, and through that, the ancestors of Scotland. So lots of Scotland stuff for me. Good. Smells yeah. really good. <laughs> well, you should finally come to Scotland. And, and I know. Go. I've never been to Scotland. Isn't that crazy? It's a shame. Like literally, <laughs> I've lived here for thirty-six years, oh and gosh. somehow <laughs> go to Scotland. Uh, <laughs> no, it is funny because I've been telling people like Scott. I think I was telling you Scots are a yeah. little bit more sad. <laughs> like I've come down here to England and like everyone's just like nice and like people cut up with each other like I was at the Morrisons and like this you know they're just talking about fish and like they're having a good time and they're laughing and it's just like in Scotland everyone's just sad. Oh 
they don't get enough serotonin no. out there. Well, and I, I Send think them it, the sun, you know. And I think it's the, it's the loss of identity too. Like there is yeah. this huge loss of identity uh, in Scotland. But wow. yeah. uh, that could be reborn again, much like spring, which is what we need to talk about now. Segway. Perfect. That's a segue. <laughs> Hello. Oh, oh, there's two dogs involved. Oh, yeah, yeah. In this, there's so. another dog down here. That's what we're chatting to. Yeah, yeah. So, Not like you, a gremlin or anything. Yeah, just so wandering around. This mighty chihuahua has killed a pheasant, it seems. Um, <laughs> oh. And wants to uh, bear witness. <laughs> Not a real pheasant. We don't do that. It's here. a real pheasant. Don't let me lie to you. So, Ruby, how did this pheasant get in the house? <laughs> wow, well, Roy, you know, she's feral. So. <laughs> Oh, so spring. Spring is like, I mean, what a time to arrive in Glastonbury for the month because it's just beautiful here at the moment. There's such a... You're such a liar. It's rained literally every day. <laughs> <laughs> this is great weather for us. Yeah. No, it's, it's sunny today. It's sunny today. <laughs> we take what we can in England, yeah. all right? A little bit of sun and you celebrate. Um, but, it's, you know, we're starting to see, like, the lambs being born and daffodils on the land and there's just this huge, gorgeous feeling of life returning. And when we're talking about like Celtic ancestors and pagan ancestors, it's really sort of thinking about how would they have felt that? How would they have felt the kind of movement through the land and the celebration of it? And it brings me so much to thinking about um, the goddess Blodwith, which is a, a Welsh deity, a Welsh goddess, it literally means flower face. And there's a, a stunning story in the Mabinogi of um, her being created out of several different flowers. Um, by a magician and um, it's, a, it's a, a lovely kind of notion of the idea I think of kind of bringing herbs and stuff together and really celebrating kind of femininity and um, the interplay that we have between if we think of the feminine as the land the mother the earth and how we treat that as well do we extract from it or do we keep giving back and so that can be a beautiful time this time of year to, to go out and really connect with the land, to plant seeds, to give back to Mother Earth um, and to kind of honour the land, whether it's like taking flowers to altars or creating kind of nature rituals and these beautiful spaces. Um, and a great time to be making flower tinctures. That's my favourite thing to do this time of year. What, um, as far as like the process of that, what would that look like? Is it just like harvesting the flowers and you kind of let them like like sit in like oil or something or water or for me the most important part of, of that whole process is the connection with the land before i take the flower mm. so i tend to find um areas to work with where i've built a relationship so the place i would visit often and i might go and read a poem or read a, po a book to the land and even things like clearing rubbish is a beautiful way to give back and tend to the land um, and then i meditate with the plants that I'm using and I, I tune in to see if it's right to to take it at the time there's kind of build a connection with that and if it feels okay too I tend to take um, just the rule of three it's almost like a hedge witch mm. kind of process um, you know a most much more gentler way of working with things and always leaving lots behind that's that's the main rule with foraging to leave lots left over to grow for other people um, and then I bring it back and I do this thing where I tend to use um, sort of a high volume spirit. So things like vodka is fine or brandy is a bit nicer tasting. Um, and to cover the flowers with it, I normally do a little bit of a ritual where I, I let the golden hour of the sunset hit it and then the rising moon. Always mm. best to pick with full moon because you get the energy, mm. the extra charge. Um, and then to leave it for six weeks and shake it every day in a shady place. Mm, yeah. And then to take the flowers out and you've got your tincture. You can kind of work with that, whether it just drops under the tongue each day and meditate with the plant and see see what lessons come through. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. that's kind of an interesting, you know, that'll be an interesting segue into like the, the shamanism as well, because mm. there's just so much to spirituality nowadays, especially like I was just reflecting while you were talking, mm. something I hadn't thought about in like a year. But one of the things a, sh a shaman told me to do is that, uh, especially during spring and summer, is uh, to do uh, sun water. And so oh, you yeah. basically leave some water outside to soak up the power of the newborn sun and you put a piece of gold in it. And oh, it like interesting. Something with the gold like extracts something from the water, especially with the heat. Yeah. And it's actually like really beneficial for you. Um, like your favorite watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you just chuck it in. Um, and then there was the opposite was moon water and they recommend putting a piece of silver in the moon water. 
Oh, that's such a stunning... That feels yeah. really alchemical as well, working mm. with the metals yeah. to kind of create something. That's a beautiful process. <laughs> oh, someone forgot to silence their phone. <laughs> and chihuahuas. Yeah, and chihuahuas. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we are very organized today. <laughs> Clearly with our Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> this, pantheons, this is an aesthetic Buddha, okay? <laughs> we accept all pantheons here. <laughs> Which is very much... Well, you got the flowers back here, too, so that works. Yeah, uh, that's got a lot of the sun rays. It is, uh, but I, I love that idea of charging things with the kind of the solar movements, mm. like the sun and the moon. That's powerful. Where did you hear about that? Is it? Uh, that was at a shaman retreat I went to in Estonia. Oh, yeah, we okay. were talking about the elements, and it was part of the elemental conversation, was how to harness the power of the moon and the sun. Which is, I love that. Yeah. No, I mean, so, and that's the thing, like, uh, you know, again, going into this kind of conversation is so much of what you hear in shamanism, you know, most shamanic cultures, uh, spiritual healing cultures didn't write things down. Mm. And so we're not going to have the book source that says, this is what you do to make solar water. Like, it's yeah. something that's orally passed down. And so you kind of have to trust that the people teaching you are telling you something that's orally passed down to them. Well, that's what I'm doing right now is I'm orally passing down this tradition to you guys that I was taught by someone else who was orally yeah. passed down. And that's what makes shamanism very difficult to talk about is a lot of it is mm. just oral tradition. Yeah. So I don't know the origin of golden water and sun, and mm. sun energy, but uh, does it work? I think is the big question. I always think Absolutely. of Pirates of the Caribbean, like the jar of dirt. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> like, oh, I'll take the jar of dirt back. No, 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 no. But then it works. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you think about it, I mean, the one thing that would have united every single sort of proto-culture, indigenous culture around the world is the sun and is the mm -hmm. moon. That's something that was available to everyone. So it kind of makes sense that every beginning culture would have had that connection to, you know, something involved in the sun, something invoking the, the moon. That's where you get the moon goddesses and things like that. And yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, I just had a friend tell me the other day, uh, and again, don't quote me on this information. Uh, this is something I heard from someone in a passive conversation at like two in the morning. Gosh. But um, <laughs> supposedly in the Arabic countries, so like in the Middle East, uh, there's a lot of stuff that traces back to them being primarily a moon worshiping culture at one point. Whereas wow, okay. we might think them as a primary sun worshiping culture. Yeah. Yeah, but there is like their chief god often was associated with the moon in pre Islamic times. I wonder, that's really cool. Because, yeah, yeah you, you think with the heat out there, it'd be more... But maybe that's why it was more, like, yeah. uh, favoured, the, the coolness of the moon well, and the evening. It's also, again, the, the weirdness of the world. It's important to remember that, like, the Middle East 10,000 years ago was a jungle. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, like, the, the Sahara Desert was all a forest at one point. Mm. Uh, and it's only in, you know, our recollection of time that it's a desert. Yeah. Which is baffling. Isn't it? The yeah. world changes so much. What a formidable place. But yeah, we're, we, we spoke a lot about, you know, do we bring up the topic of shamanism? Because it's kind of connected uh, with everything that we're talking well, about. Well, we've already really. offended by people by saying shamanism. <laughs> <laughs> people are furious already. Yeah, well, and that's the thing, like, uh, you know, I've been in, how long have you been interested in, like, shamanism? Oh, God, I mean, I don't even know where it began. I think, in a way, children are, they're already accessing those trance-like states in other worlds more mm. than adults. The kind of, I mean, if you think about shamanism by definition, it's accessing states of other consciousness mm. through whatever means to contact other worlds in order to yeah. bring back healing for the village or individual. Mm. And the, the thing with the word shaman, obviously, it's quite protected because it belongs to a tribe in Siberia. And it's really important to tread carefully around that. And that's something that's you know really important to honor. But there's that kind of confusion and blurred line with, is shamanism or shamanic okay? And uh, we, we've spoke a lot about this because so much of what we do and so much that's in the pagan community is, of course, shamanic. It is exactly those things, accessing altered states, communing with other deities and gods and bringing back healing and, you know, wisdom. So it's, uh, it's an interesting word, you yeah. know, it's an interesting word it's because it has that blurred line. Yeah, well, and from what I understand, uh, based on the research I've done, is that the reason we use the term shaman is because that's what scholars and mm. anthropologists chose to use. Yeah. So when they started researching these things, mostly in the, you know, the 1950s, 1970s, 1980s, it seems to be when a lot of the, the research was done where a lot of uh, people from America and Europe went to South America to start doing research on shamanism, mm. and some to a lesser extent Siberia, but for the most part, uh, and Mongolia, but for the most part, most people research South American shamanism. 
Yeah. And there it's not even used. Like, they don't even use the term shaman. Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, like, most of the time, uh, when I went to Ecuador, they called themselves facilitators in English. They, mm. Or, or uh, uh, like, mama or papa or uncle or t yeah. uh, taita, I think is another term I heard. Uh, but you're not going to hear the term shaman in, in South America yeah. unless they're talking to a Western audience. Uh, then they might use the word shaman. Uh, That's funny, isn't it? So yeah. it's actually a word that we've given... Yeah, it's a word that West, so Americans and Europeans gave South American traditions that is a word from Siberia. Wow! <laughs> Full circle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what a cooking pot. <laughs> it's, it's baffling, yeah. Yeah, uh, so it's a really interesting topic, and it's it, one that's sort of worthy of picking up on, right? right? Well, and that's the thing, like, when we use this term, you know, it's just mm. the term that you are going to recognize. Yeah. Um, it's not something that, you know, we recognize the problems that come with this terminology. However, it's how you're going to research it. It's how you're going to find books about it. It's how you're going to talk about it with other peoples is using this language. Totally. Because it has become the common language. Yeah. And uh, it's like a descriptive word, isn't it? In the same way that not everyone can call themselves a magician, because that probably takes a lot of training in certain areas. But the word magic is something which applies to every indigenous culture around the world. Um, and it's a, it, I feel like we're at that point now in our history, especially on the British Isles, where we're really trying to dig deep. I mean, you know, for what, what were our ancient ancestors doing? What magical practices were they doing? And what shamanic traditions did we have here? And so it is a word that's necessary to start exploring that, mm. I think, and to start unpicking that. And um, yeah, with trepidation and, right. you know, with sensitivity. Yeah, because we discuss this when it comes to yeah. like your retreat and stuff like that. Like, what alternative words would you use? And so, for like my yeah. instance, I'm saying healing circle yeah. is what I'm using, which sounds a little bit more generic. Um, but you know, again, that might not lend people to understand what that means. Like, yeah. am I going to be sitting there wrapping band aids on people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it's actually a first they, they, for Yeah, they show up and like I'm like, where are your injuries? <laughs> like, I, I got some splints in here. To Get the hammer. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And of course, there comes with the you know uh, the other side of things, which is uh, with the term shaman and, and the internet. You know, the people that take a, an hour of shamanism course and call themselves a shaman. Yeah. Like I would never, I wouldn't call myself a shaman currently. Yeah. Uh, you know, I might say I practice shamanism. Exactly. But I'm not a shaman. Yeah, that's such an important thing. You know, especially yeah, I, I think I'm exactly the same as, you know, when I give people the certificates for Celtic healing, I make it very clear like. Guys, you've been exploring Celtic shamanism, but that does not qualify you to use the word shaman in your title. Right. That means you're a healer now, you know, and it's the yeah, same yeah, yeah. thing. So it's really good. Yeah, it's good to clarify these things. And I guess what I'm curious in as well is the experiences that pagans are having that are shamanic. Because, I mean, when I've, I've seen a few videos of the work you do, it looks so incredible. I mean, that kind of trance-like states and the mm. rituals and... Can you speak to uh, like any experiences that you've had in your circles that are incredibly like shamanic? <laughs> Where is your I'm phone? Turn that ping off. That's yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about shamanism, Kubi. Turn the damn phone off. <laughs> they no tell respect. them they can wait. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I tell you, uh, okay. I say this with much love. I enjoyed my ayahuasca experience. But one thing that pissed me off is the shaman who was from like the villages of the Amazon had his phone on oh. and he was using his phone <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and like I kind of feel like he is from a different world like 100% this man is not from the west like he is he took a canoe to come to us uh, and so like I he get sure it. as hell had his podcast and yeah. his phone and, and so that but this on. is an interesting conversation because in the the modern neo-shamanism mm. using your phone is like never like, yeah. you don't even enter spaces with your phone. It's like, turn that off at the very least. Keep it yeah. away. Do not use it during ceremonies. Like, this is a very much like a sacred thing. Yeah. But that is not a thing in traditional, some traditional shaman communities. Because, like, this yeah. guy's probably like, I actually have internet service for the first time in six months, so I'm going to use my phone while a bunch of these white people do ayahuasca. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know, like, that, I don't know if that's why he did it, but, like, that, that might be the reason. Uh, because, yeah, we all took the ayahuasca, and then uh, we were all sitting there waiting for it to kick in, and all of a sudden you hear, like, audible, like, phone noises, and you, like, open your eyes, and he's in his, like, little <laughs> hammock, like, watching, like, TikTok. <laughs> I was that. like, what? <laughs> what a meeting of worlds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I've been chewing on that for a while. Like, it is very interesting, because, like, obviously yeah. I went to uh, the Amazon to do ayahuasca for the first mm -hmm. time in a respectful way, done by someone that was from the Amazon. That was really important for me. Yeah. Um, to understand where the medicine came from. But through that experience, because I had a friend that went to a different experience in, like, America. 
and they had like amazing facilities. No one had their damn phone on them, you know, and it was like very manicured experience. Whereas yeah. mine was very raw. It's like get in the dirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like yeah. I felt uncomfortable <laughs> and dirty afterwards. Yeah. And so it's kind of that duality of like some people actually have better healing experiences in these more manicured mm -hmm. environments. Uh, whereas, you know, going to an environment where it is a little rougher yeah. can lead to different experiences. Yeah, absolutely. With, with your retreats, do you find that the, the sort of more shamanic aspects come from, from kind of getting in the dirt and kind of getting into nature? Do you yeah. find that something comes from that? Yeah, I guess I never answered your original question. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to tell you, I As soon as you said that, I was like, oh yeah, I didn't answer. Uh, it's probably Sorry, my, I got you back. <laughs> yeah, I am probably ADHD somewhere in there. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so for me, I think a lot of the rituals that I perform are about pe getting people in a state, because typically our, our retreats are like three or four days. Um, and that's a very, really limited time to remove people from their nine to five, remove people from their dramas uh, and themselves. You have to do a lot very quickly. And so I think the importance of ritual is providing an environment where someone can disconnect from who they are on the outside. Right. Disconnect from the bullshit. I suppose that comes with a feeling of safety as well, providing yeah. a really safe container to kind of let go into that. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, like obviously I I think that's where I kind of made my name. Uh, I've definitely gotten a little quieter over the years, but I was very loud when I first started making videos and recording my rituals and stuff like that. But I think that's a lot of the primalness is I felt like I was living in this non-primal world where I wasn't allowed to scream and I wanted to scream. Yeah. Um, I should feel like I, I should scream for my gods and, and the nature mm. that I love. You know, I feel like that's, that's showing the passion I have for these things. Uh, they've definitely calmed down over the years a little bit, but uh, I say that and uh, the Odin ritual we did at Yule was very like, ah, yeah. yeah. But I think those rituals have a, a, a purpose. I think it brings things to the surface that you realize yeah. uh, and then you can begin to work on them. Um, so uh, oftentimes, I have a plan for what I want to do with a ritual, uh, and I can have these ideas of invoking trance, but I don't actually know what's going to do until afterwards. Um, yeah. And then I can take notes about it, perform it again, and now know what it does and right. Im improve on it. Um, I suppose yeah. that's the thing with ritual, isn't it? The most powerful ones are the intuitive ones, the ones that kind of come through almost like an ancestral inner knowing. Yeah. You know, I remember um, watching one of your videos once of, were you dressed as wolves? You got like these wolf skins or something? Well, I, I was a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, really? Yeah, I didn't no. see that there. <laughs> no, I, yeah, that's the, uh, my, my uh, spiritual uh, garb is turkey and duck feathers because my spirit guides are a turkey and a duck. So I, I act as a turkey. <laughs> I love that. So yeah. Well, uh, I love that. <laughs> so I have all the, I think I know which one you're talking about. And that one was very intense. That was again, not really planned, but we had a yeah. bunch of guys there who connected to the wolf spirit and like the berserkers and, and the wolf head in our, yeah. uh, and the Odin ritual we had planned was already intense. And so we kind of made it into this shape shifting ritual. Um, and See, that's, I mean, when I hear that, I'm like, wow, you don't get more shamanic than that. Yeah, you know, yeah, this yeah. accessing of animal yeah, states wild. and embodying the animals to, to reach those trance states. Yeah. Are you going to do, uh, you're going to do one in, uh, in May. You should just make them, I make do. Them go weird. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do just like trying to contact the animal familiar and that involves a lot of drumming and trancing out and drinking a few kind of herbal concoctions to create that lucidity. Um, but one of the most um, shamanic experiences I think I've had as a pagan is um, sound weaving. So when you mm. kind of, you know, you're there with your drums and you're going into these kind of based on the Arwithian chanting, sort of chanting the Arwen in the spirit of the kind of Peltic. Pel pe Peltic? <laughs> Remix. So where were the Peltics from? <laughs> <laughs> the kind of Celtic pagan kind of you know, life force of inspiration and chanting that over and over again as a group and then moving into sound weaving. And you find that these, these lucid states that are explored through sound itself, where there's these massive purges, sometimes people will like release and scream and cry and then there'll be like tears of laughter. And, you know, that it almost feels like it's in those states that we can meet the old gods. They seem to come through sound. Um, and you know, yeah, it's just, it's been so beautiful, some of those experiences. Yeah. And so it sounds like that kind of mixes with the Celtic in the sense of using like Celtic words, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. you have a similar thing with, because I remember we were talking about the runes on the high street the other day mm, about yeah, yeah. chanting the runes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so my overall philosophy in the runes after, you know, four or five years of, of thinking about it and, and practicing different things is most people know the runes today as a divination device. Mm. Uh, but at the end of the day, we don't really know if they used the runes to divine in the ancient past. Uh, the chances are they didn't. Uh, we've never found uh, a rune set far as I know. Um, really? I don't think we have a historic rune set. I could be wrong, There could be, uh, but I'm pretty sure we don't. Um, That's fascinating. Rune sets didn't really become a thing until like, I think the 1800s. So is it just mentioned in the kind of Nordic texts? So the two examples you have of runes are the written ones that are on stones today, which mm. are literally just spelling. Uh, I've seen many rune stones. They're really cool, but most of them say, Gundar buried his son here, Thorgelson. May Odin bless him. That is 90% of every rune stone. Every now and then you get a cool okay. one. There was one cool one that like on the front side it was like that. It was like mm. Harolf was buried here, blah, 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 blah. But on the back side, it was like basically if you try to touch this stone, you will be cursed. Okay. So that is the only example I've seen of written runes being used. Wow. But I don't know if the runes itself were the curse or if it was just simply saying like, hey, don't touch this stone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this right? Yeah. Not this guy. Uh, so those are the, you know, uh, there are various things that have the runes. There's some Mjolnirs that have runes on them. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some other small artifacts like you know, there's been bones that have been found with runes on them, but they were just a spelling. And then they combine that, uh, basically, runologists in like the 1800s combine that with um, modern esotericism, with like tarot and things like that, yeah. and they kind of combine that into what we know runes is today as a divination device. Um, so that's where it kind of came from. And then within the Norse text, we have examples of the runes being used as magic. But mm -hmm. we don't, it doesn't say the Fehu rune is used for this magic. It just says there is a rune of magic that is used for this. And it doesn't specify what that rune is. Oh. Yeah, it's come like. On, guys. Uh, like I was just reading this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just reading one today. It's uh, Sigdrufamal. For anyone who's interested in the Norse, you must read Sigdrufamal. Mm -hmm. uh, Sigdrufamal is one of the best stories. It gets slept on all the time. Uh, it's basically about, I believe, Sigurd going up and he frees a Valkyrie that was imprisoned by Odin which is just a badass story. And then this Valkyrie like gives him a bunch of like spells essentially. Mm. Uh, like one of the spells is like, you know, how to, you know, create beer runes, how to create book runes, how to create, you know, uh, victory runes. But it doesn't really ever tell you how they create them. It's just like, there's beer runes. <laughs> like what the hell is a beer rune? The you beer know? runes sound good. <laughs> yeah. I think they do honey mead runes. There was something about mead as well. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I, I could talk all day about this stuff clearly, clearly. But actually, a blessing I use, if anyone's been a part of my, my shamanic circles, uh, my initial blessing is actually from Sigrid from all. Uh, so I'm, I'm not perfect in Old Norse, but essentially it's Heldagar, Heldagar Seni, Hel Nip. So I memorize all that's that. That's pretty good. <laughs> pretty, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, but essentially it's a, it's a blessing. So you say, hail, hail day, hail night, hail night and its daughters, hail the gods, hail the goddesses. Um, mm. Gosh, I can't remember the English now. I just remember the Old Norse. But, um, and then it basically says, we ask for your blessings and for mm. healing hands. Maiden Lefum is healing hands. Ah, so it's just mention on healing hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. So that's quite important, isn't it? Yeah. That there's that aspect is mentioned and documented. Yeah. Uh, so there are little little clues. Uh, yeah. And so that's one thing when a lot of people ask me, uh, like, oh, what what prayer do you use or something like that? What I recommend is finding what calls to you because I mm. own an old, uh, a poetic edda that's in the Old Norse and I own an English translation. And basically, I look through and compare the two, and I find things that one sound cool. Yeah. Because they have to sound cool. And then I find stuff that is like, you know, applicable to the situation. Uh, yeah. And I think you'd be really surprised how much there is as far as like prayers that you can memorize. Wow, that is cool. Yeah. yeah, it's good to have like a basis, isn't there? And then make it personal, kind of put your, again, your intuition into it. Yeah. It's the, the closest thing we have to, I think, what our ancestors would have done to tap into. It's like, what what is your, how do your ancestors speak through you? How can you make this your own? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting with the runes because I was uh, reading parts of the Book of Owens, which is basically the Celtic pagan version of not. I guess it's used as a divination tool in the same way, mm -hmm. and it references the Nordic runes in mm. the Book of Owens, um, and that's how we know it is used for divination, or one of the ways we know it was used for divination. But when was that book written? Oh, don't challenge me on dates, <laughs> God. <laughs> I, I would put a penny on it. It was written in the eighteen hundreds at the latest. Oh, no, hang on. It was much earlier than that. 
much, 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 much earlier. Really? Is it like an actual historical text? Yeah, like medieval. Really? Yeah, I think so. We can put the date here. <laughs> You're asking a lot of me. Here. <laughs> Jacob will edit. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. You keep talk I'll talking. I'll keep about talking. <laughs> yeah, and the Oems are another way of uh, channeling, I feel, as well, because what the Oems do is they work with, there's like lists in the Book of Oems, and one of these lists is about trees. Um, and it's got a list of different trees that you can work with. And I tend to work with them month by month. Um, and you kind of make a stave, and you can use the staves as divination, similar to the runes. Um, but what I find so, again, shamanic is this aspect of when I'm working with each tree from month to month, you know, even whether it's just sitting underneath the tree or drinking the leaves of the tea in like a honey tea with water. Yeah, I do that. I've been drinking trees. <laughs> drinking trees. <laughs> I find that I begin channeling the wisdom of that tree. Um, so like next month I'm working with Hawthorne. And, uh, you know, she's just, it's just such a powerful tree. And you, you find that your life begins to kind of mirror the lessons. It brings these, these life lessons to you, which reflect the teachings of each tree. And I love that, because that's the kind of feeling of, like, the trees being the elders as well, the trees being the ancestors. And it's so supernatural that I can't even really... You know, you kind of just have to do it and experience it. Have, have, we, have we got I mean, a date? I have the answer. <laughs> what? The, the 17th century, so 16th. Oh, is it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? I thought it'd be much, much earlier than that. Yeah, I mean, it's still earlier than I thought, but that would yeah, make sense. Somewhere in between. I'm trying to think, like, uh, the Icelandic Book of Spells, I think. Uh, was it the Galdabrok or something like that? Like, where I'm pretty sure the Vegvasir comes from. Yeah. Uh, I think was, like, the 1600s as well. Oh, isn't it? Yeah. It's so I much... mean, we have to think about books weren't around really much until the 15th and 1600s. Uh, I mean, they were, but they were mostly the illuminated manuscripts and things like that. Yeah. So they yeah, didn't get yeah. a little bit more free flowy until later. Yeah, they were kind of like reserved for the elites, weren't they? Well, they, they took so much work. They had someone in their hand painting like every page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. God, we take it for granted, don't we, books? Yeah. And now I'm just looked up something on Wikipedia. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you go down a rabbit hole there momentarily. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> I mean, was, I, I've never heard of it before. Uh, and that's the thing that uh, I, I've constantly been amazed by, uh, by the spiritual path. Uh, and I mean, you've been into spirituality much longer than me. And, you know, it's like I'm always finding out something new. And yeah. I think that's really cool. Um, and especially, that's one of the difficult things for me about shamanism as well. As the moment you start going into it, you immediately, in my opinion, I'd be curious if you think this as well, you immediately have to become more open. Mm. because you have to get information from everywhere. Um, because it's just, there's, there really is no Celtic tradition of shamanism. There's yeah. remnants of what it could have been, uh, more so than I think the Norse. Uh, but the Norse, like, we're pretty sure they had shamans, but we know next to nothing about what the shamans did. Yeah. And so if we went off based on the information we had about the Norse, it, it's almost nothing. And so you have to be influenced by the South American. You have to be influenced by the Siberian and the Mongolian uh, in order to have anything. Even just to get a clue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a difference, isn't there, between respectfully sort of inquiring about what that would have looked like rather than actually extracting from the culture. Yeah. There's a massive difference between them, and I think one can be done really respectfully, you know. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, this is, uh, this is why shamanism, again, becomes a rabbit hole conversation and, mm. and, a, and a landmine conversation because it, it does teeter on the cultural appropriation side. Yeah. of how do you balance respect and learning or and, and not and just culturally appropriating something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I, w I was having this conversation with someone the other day, like, uh, you know, uh, I've really gotten into hoppe, uh, which is a uh, plant medicine, which is basically just tobacco. Uh, mm. I was introduced uh, to hoppe by a Norwegian shaman. Yeah. And even though it's a South American medicine. And so it's like, where does the line stop? You know, who taught him? I don't know. But now it's like it's made its way to me and it's not even through a South American person, but it's found its way to me. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so we have to play that game of like how do we respect the medicine and understand like it kind of has a life of its own. Yeah. It's a, they actually they say that about ayahuasca as well, that she's so intelligent that she's found her way around the globe in order to heal it. Mm. I do love that idea. I suppose it's just the, yeah, as long as you're not sort of leaving a culture dry of their natural resource of something. I suppose that's one of the key things. Um, I've been really trying to dig into what our ancestors in the British Isles would have been exploring as perhaps shamanic herbs, mm. because there's little evidence of that. I mean, there's like a, there's one grave of a, like a druid archaeological find where yeah. there was a, a cup, a ceremonial cup with mugwort. So we know mugwort would have been used as like a, a herb of a, sort of a, it's got sort of 
I wouldn't say hallucinogenic, but it certainly creates a lucidity, uh, which is quite perfect for trance-like states. And then there's the Amanita mushroom as well. Yeah. But there's no evidence anywhere of druids using Amanita or Liberty caps. Well, that's because they were really high. <laughs> <laughs> too high to document. Yeah, yeah, no, that's clearly the answer. <laughs> but you think, you know... Well, they also didn't write them. things down. They didn't write that down. Was like it, was, thing. it was orally passed on. Yeah. But there's been no like evidence of it found mulched up in, like, preserved in stomachs or cups or right. anything like that. Yeah. Which is fascinating. So you think, you know, surely they must have been using these. Yeah. <laughs> they grew all over the land here. Don't mind um, me. I'm just, I, I'm looking at my phone to make sure the recording is going good. That is all. <laughs> Keep talking. Keep talking. Mom. That's what's yeah, happening. mommy, I'm, ha I'm having a, a pagan chat today. <laughs> There's a dog. He's actually real. People might just think I'm holding a cuddly toy. There was actually a few people that thought that in the video I made with you. Really? Because yeah, he didn't move at all <laughs> the whole time. Yeah, yeah. He's a veteran. He's 14 years old. So he's very like, just chilled. I'm lucky to have such a chilled dog. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the other one. A little Roy. Roy, who's not featured in any films because she's too aloof to come up for cuddles. I think she was a bitten one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like very briefly. Um, so as far as like, uh, what is, I guess we can share kind of our personal experiences. Yeah, uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of what was your, it's, what's your journey with uh, shamanism and it's kind of work been? Um, in terms of medicinal mushrooms. <laughs> oh, oh, do we still want, oh, so you still want to talk about psychedelics. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought that was the segue. Oh, actually, We're do we want to talk about psychedelics, and then we can talk about our experiences? I think that's probably a big part of the shamanic uh, experience. Well, I mean, things. someone just the other day uh, was asking me, because uh, they were like, because I was saying I don't use psychedelics in my, my ceremonies, yeah. and they're like, how is that possible? Yeah, you know, right. I think there is this idea that shamanism has to live, exist with psychedelics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think that there is plant medicine involved in a lot, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you're over here like, fuck no, I want to do mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing mushrooms every time. <laughs> That's disappointing. I wanted to come and get high. Yeah, she, she's not coming to Scotland. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. I think some of the most profound uh, trance-like states can be accessed through... Oh. I've lost the uh, no, your chinchilla. Hair, no, you're good. Yeah, your, your hair was just going a little crazy. Um, yeah, one of the most powerful trance-like states I've ever accessed has been through the voice, through uh, chanting, through just connecting with others, actually, in mm. like a conscious way. Um, yeah, and through maybe just being out on the land a long time as well. You know, that can be incredible. And I have a, a, a theory as well that we don't even need to extract that much from the plants. So there's this whole thing of kind of, um, I offer it as a one-to-one -one service actually for anyone that's interested, is working uh, with microdosing ayahuasca. And not the illegal kind before. Not Please that we come would ever and do me. these things. <laughs> it's um, Banisteriopsis capi, which is, you know, the legal non-psychoactive part of the vine. And I was trying to find like a, a conscious way to work with a plant that isn't going to extract too much or, you know, end up in sort of some messy trance-like state. Um, and microdosing this, like three drops, can be a beautiful way to walk with a plant medicine in a way that's so gentle and you can still hear the powerful lessons of those plants um, without taking these. I mean, we have quite a thing in the West of just extracting huge amounts of something. Mm. Um, it's quite nice to reverse that and do something very gentle uh, and thoughtful with these plants instead. But my big one, yeah, I'm quite curious to see what happens. Uh, I've been brewing one, actually. I can, I can show you one oh. right here. Show us the illicit substance. <laughs> so, this oh, my is, gosh. Uh, it's so much bigger than I expected. I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a Druid's Brew, I've called it, which is honey, mead, and vervain. Um, which was documented to have been harvested by the Druids with the rising of the dog star, known as Sirius. Um, so presumably that would have been used in some mm. sort of sacred way. Uh, and I'll let you know how I got with that. I'm going to try just, you know, a full moon experimentation, having a little tipple of a vein. Your microphone's freaking me out. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> She's so animated. just flops around. <laughs> there we go. That's better. Yeah, because the hair keeps taking it and, like, doing things with it. Shall I put my hair back here? No, I think, it's, I think it's fine now. Yeah? I think you're good. We're good? We're good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's different things that we can definitely work with natively on these lands. And, you know, my coven, the sisters that I work with, we've also had experiments with things like dandelion. Mm. Working with dandelion, and we did a three-day fast 
where we just drunk dandelion juice yeah. and dandelion water. And we found that there was these profound transformations and deep kind of trance states that we were entering, <laughs> not just because we were hungry and hallucinating, but, you know, actually like visually seeing the teachings of the dandelion. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. this is very much a thing. Like, uh, I think it's even written, I mean, it's interesting, we've not mentioned Michael Harner this entire time. Uh, Go ahead. We might actually be the, one of the longest minute conversations, uh, but not about <laughs> Michael Harner. Um, <laughs> and I've talked about this extensively in my video on shamanism, but most people reference Michael Harner when they talk about shamanic practice because he developed what is known as core shamanism, uh, which is the basis for what most people build a shamanic practice. Mm -hmm. But again, it's mostly based on the South American. Uh, and even in his book, Way of the Shaman, I think he talks about how to connect to a specific plant spirit. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you do it is like basically you ingest some of it and then you do a shamanic journey and you find that plant in the spirit world and you commune with that plant to understand it better. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. And is that with the idea that you build a relationship with it so that you can get there without taking it again? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And there's also something to it for like uh, learning the plant spirit so you can extract evil spirits with the plant spirit as an ally. That's very useful. Yeah, there's all kinds of weird, crazy <laughs> stuff in shamanism. Like, you know, you don't want to be like, shamanism is cool. But, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> but it's kind of cool sometimes. That was actually one of the, the one of my teachers. Like, he started with like, shamanism is a mm. shit job. It mm. doesn't, it's not, you know, it doesn't look cool. We do these things because it's necessary, you know. Yeah. I'm like, but you do look pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It's part of the reward. I mean, I suppose the other side of, of it is that it's, it's gnarly work. It Although is. Although it doesn't look yeah. cool on the surface, it's, it's a lot of it is about journeying into your own personal underworld to meet your psyche at a really deep level. I mean, we, we talk about shadow work. It's become quite sort of a buzzword in the spiritual community. But when people really think about what actually is that, you know, it's, you know, accessing and meeting those inner demons and befriending them. And, and that's another thing. I think it shows up a lot in Celtic folklore, a lot of the like the Arthurian legends. You know, you see Arthur going into a trip on this magical boat into the underworld, you know, and he gets, you know, <laughs> and there's always like tasks that happen. And there's always like heroes that have like literally they're disembodied by creatures there and then put back together again. And I think those are really perfect metaphors, those stories of a shamanic experience. In Celtic folk. I mean, the moment I did ayahuasca, Odin's journey made way more sense. <laughs> like, what, almost all of Odin's journey is just an ayahuasca trip. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it literally, you know, like, uh, one of the things Odin has to do to receive knowledge is to drink from a well of, like, sacred waters of, like, the universe, you know, and he has yeah. to sacrifice something to the well to drink from it, and so it's very much reminiscent of, like, a, a medicine you would take, like a plant medicine. And doesn't he hang himself upside down, did you say? The other well, day? not necessarily upside down, but, yeah, then he, he self-sacrifices himself from, mm. he hangs himself from the world tree, pierced by his own spear, and essentially fast, you know, he mm. does a seven-day, seven-night fast, and at the end he receives magical knowledge of the runes. That's incredible, isn't yeah. it? And I read somewhere that it's an ash tree, supposedly, is that right? Because that I'm creates a sure. whole other thing to it. Because yeah. uh, in the Oum, the ash tree is like the Axis Mundi. It's like the it's almost like the spiritual Kundalini that weaves between the masculine and feminine. It's like the worldly knowledge, universal yeah. wisdom. So it ties in. Oh well, now we're entering uh, yeah. almost needing to put. Oh, we need to have like little tinfoil hats and like, <laughs> like, like, because like it, it, when you start looking into global shamanic culture, you realize there's so many commonalities. Yeah. Uh, and it really suggests that at one point there was a society that practiced very similar things that fell apart at some point. Yeah. And the Cherokee even have a story of this. Like the Cherokee uh, have a story of the Star People. I think we, mm. we were talking about this. And like the Star People were a unified people that had similar traditions, and then something happened and the society fell apart. Yeah. Uh, and it even says, like the book I was reading, which is a Cherokee book, was talking about how uh, we in the West, or the, you know, the American, the white man, uh, calls it Atlantis. Mm. And it's like, so every culture has a story of this great city that once existed and then it fell apart. Yeah. And so if you really, it doesn't take that much of a tinfoil hat to think that at one point the human, the human race was much more together. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I think shamanism is a remnant of what they used to have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, I mean, you, when you were talking about your ayahuasca experience, um, I remember you sharing something that was really beautiful, something about the tree and the songs. I can't, I can't remember the exact oh, yeah, quote, yeah. but it's summarized Well, I haven't it. shared everything about my ayahuasca experience publicly. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, no, one of the things, mm. uh, which is very common in global mythology as well, is the idea of the world tree. Or yeah. what is it, Access Monday? Is there's just this global idea that the spirit world is held together by a tree. 
mm-hmm. or at the very least, uh, upper, lower, and middle world. Like yeah. this is the very common setup: upper, lower, and middle. Some have two, some have three, some have nine. Like mm-hmm. if you really think about it, like you know the nine realms of Norse mythology. Depends um, which lift that you take in the building. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've seen really good maps. Uh, the the nine realms of Norse mythology really fall well together in this three layer dynamic. Um, and so one of the things I witnessed on ayahuasca uh, was this big glowing like pink tree and there was all these beings around it and they looked like from all over the world and they were all singing to the tree and the guide that was with me at the time said you know like they're all singing reverence to the tree uh, to to life Uh, Mm. they're just using different languages and different songs I love that I think that is the perfect metaphor for what we're talking about here it's that of course, any land around this beautiful, formidable planet would have had a shamanic culture, an indigenous way of being. And uh, it's, all, it's all in order to celebrate life and to explore these great mysteries together. And so really, I feel like it's almost in our earthly inheritance to be able to explore these things and to inquire in such a thoughtful and tender way what were our ancestors doing yeah. on each land that we tread. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm trying to think of another. Uh, we we have so much. This could be a very long podcast. <laughs> I yeah. just feel like there's we've so. We've been m- here for hours. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, what did you put in my coffee? <laughs> Tested the vervain uh, now on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's yeah, there's so much to it. When you, I think when you first scratch the surface of you know paganism, uh, especially yeah. like Norse or Celtic, like you'd be like, oh, there's not a lot of there. Or the Druids, especially the Druids, you'd be like, oh, there's not a lot in the Druids. Yeah. But you start you know clinging to little things and doing more and more research, and before you know. It, like you're just in this wide web yeah. of just knowledge yeah uh both new and old alike and it's a really beautiful thing yeah um and one of the things uh, i referenced at the beginning is like you know we're all indigenous people uh, the person that said this was a shaman that i met in estonia uh he is from the southwest of america he's his native american mm-hmm. um really like just uh like down to earth guy like the, one of the most relaxed people you ever met like my conversation with him and i'm not saying using this accent to be offensive this is literally how he talked this is a mimic of him. I was like, you know, we started talking. Uh, this is how I get canceled. <laughs> but I mean, this is, I, the moment. this is the moment. Yeah, that happened years ago. Uh, but I was just like, oh, hey, you know, I'm from America. And he's like, oh, where from? And I was like, from Kentucky. And he was just like, oh, lots of snakes. <laughs> like, this is the sage wisdom I get. Uh, <laughs> Weird. He didn't mention the chicken. No, uh, no, not for chicken. That's, chi- that's usually cliche, what it is. Right? Uh, it was just the snakes, and I'll never forget like that exact cadence. Just like, oh yes, snakes. snakes <laughs> yes, yes. That's what he knows in my home life. <laughs> uh, but one of the things he was saying during his speech um, in front of everyone, which he had to have a translator because most people there spoke Estonian. I mean, how wild is it? This Native American shaman from the southwest of America is in Estonia, of all places. Uh, but he's really passionate about Estonia. And mm-hmm. one of the reasons he said this is, is because, you know, we all used to have these shamanic cultures, all used to have these techniques. And he's like, it's the jobs of the people who still have their traditions to share it with people who lost theirs. Oh, yeah. And like, that's yeah. just not a sentiment we hear as much anymore because because of like the cultural appropriation conversation is there yeah. are people who genuinely want to help. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's going to take the people that want to help and the people that want to respect coming together to make the world a better place. Oh, yeah, I love that idea. It's like a meeting place in the middle, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, like, one of the things he said is, you know, being in Estonia, people are really big into sauna there, uh, which is, is your lesson. You don't say sauna anymore. It's sauna. Yeah. Sauna. Got it. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of kudos <laughs> okay. when I was in Finland and Estonia, and I was like, yeah, the sauna. And they're like, good, you know how to actually say it. Sauna. <laughs> sauna. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's how you. That's how you get in with the fence, uh, and then you do the sauna. But that's one of the things that um, uh, the, the shaman was talking about. He's like, in my culture, we have the sweat lodge. And yeah. He's like, and in your culture, a world away, you have the sauna, and the sauna has its own culture. It has its own tradition. Like some people in my Finnish video actually said that sauna is the most spiritual place to the Finns. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, whereas most people anywhere else are just like, yeah, it's where you go to sweat with a bunch of other sweaty people. I mean, they had sweat houses in in Scotland quite, like, far back. Um, There's no evidence of them being, like, uh, not psychedelic, for use for psychedelic reasons or kind of trance-like states. But generally, whenever I've gone in a sauna, not a sauna, Sauna. you do eventually access trance states. You can't help it, especially if you're chanting in there Mm. or you're singing songs or you're, you know, intentionally trying to invoke a trance state. Yeah. Heat is certainly one way to do it. So I do wonder about the kind of Scottish sweat houses, whether they, they did have another... Maybe that's why they're depressed still. Like, they, they stopped doing them. 
get the, back the, in the sweat house. Yeah, oh, yeah. Man. Get back in there you and sweat. You deserve it. <laughs> it's warm in there. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. Like there are very few saunas in uh, in Scotland. Yeah. And it's a place that, considering how cold and gray and just like wet it is all the time, I feel like a sauna would do really well there. Yeah. If not, just good for the immune system. Nothing yeah. else. You know. I think that's what they were traditionally used for. More kind of health benefits. But they're very cute. They look like little hobbit houses. They're like covered in turf. Really? Yeah, you should check them out. Yeah, you go there. yeah, they're very uncommon then. Yeah. Because I mean, I've seen much of Scotland and yeah. I know a lot of Scotland and I've barely heard of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm always down for a hobbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but one thing I was going to say on the topic of plant medicine before mm. we move past that. Uh, in in the UK, and uh, I mean, you can't speak for all of Europe, but for, in the UK, do you feel there is a, like a taboo cons around plant medicine? Or are people fairly accepting of it? Um, I'm in a bit of a bubble because I'm in Clastonbury. <laughs> yeah, so everyone's here. quite accepting of it here. Um, if I think about if I, if I was to announce it at a family dinner, maybe it would be different. <laughs> right. Swings and roundabouts, you know what I mean? It depends who you're talking to. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have encountered more resistance to plant medicine as a concept in the mm. States. Uh, and I think it's because we've had such an aggressive war on drugs in the yeah. States. And so there's a very big cultural taboo on plant medicines. Uh, and they do get abused and people abuse it and, and whatnot. And that's very true. But they're definitely, you can tell when you mention it, people immediately start thinking of the bad side right away. Yeah. And it, the association with drugs as well. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, as a, as a sort of a party thing or a mm. way to get high. And, yeah, it can get really murky, can't it? Yeah, and if I have any sage advice, and I, I don't even know if YouTube will allow me to say this, but if I have any sage advice is uh, mushrooms are very big in the States. Like, a lot of people look for a spiritual experience with mushrooms, and it's true here. A lot of people I talk to here, mm. their, their main spiritual experience is mushrooms. Yeah. Um, and when you actually look into the science of them, to get the – there's a very specific environment you have to create to get the healing effects of mushrooms. Mm. Everyone thinks it's outside. It's not. Uh, outside can be fun and it can be really reflective. I've done them outside. It's great looking at the trees like, wow, you're my brother. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like that's a lot of fun. Like, don't get me wrong. But to actually get the benefits of doing psilocybin mushrooms, it's better to do them in a way that's very similar to do ayahuasca. And it's in the fact that you do it in a controlled environment, a very controlled amount. Uh, you're blindfolded mm. and you listen to very specific music throughout yeah. the course. Enya. <laughs> <laughs> what? Enya from the 80s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that is. But, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you love it. Go and listen to it. It's just like Enya the hot crust buns all over again. <laughs> I'm afraid so. It yeah, must yeah. be a British reference. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I'm going to listen to High Long. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's true. The, the whole thing of going within and without, mm. that's sometimes one of the most beautiful ways to meet plant medicines. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, I do think there is something to, to journeying outside with them because you can learn the wisdom of nature and there's a lot yeah. that comes through that way. Thins the veil. But yeah, it does. It absolutely does. But there is something about meeting yourself for that true, deep, deep healing of the psyche. And that means being left alone with yourself blindfolded. Yeah. That can be one of the most powerful transcendental experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And I need to say with this as well, like if this is how you wish to do mushrooms, you need to find the appropriate space to do it. I don't have those recommendations for you. I've not done mushrooms in this way. I've done them in the exploratory hippie way like everyone else has. But, uh, you know, while I've had a good time, I've also ultimately not gotten the answers I've been seeking, I think. Right. Uh, and it's nice to have a trip sitter. Yeah, if yeah. If you've got, a, you know, a friend that you can really trust to keep you safe and keep an eye on you, to ask the right questions perhaps sometimes as yeah. well can be really And understand useful. what to do when something goes wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because especially, you know, with my ayahuasca experience, you know, uh, I think I mentioned this in the video I made about it, but I felt safe the whole time. Yeah. Like, ayahuasca is a scary event. Like, you yeah. really come to terms with some really dark things sometimes. And I had a very light experience compared to most people. Mm -hmm. And having someone there that is taking care of you, both literally and uh, spiritually, is very, very important. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. And I, I see it far too often of people who do mushrooms who do them in a party way, who think it's spiritual. Oh my goodness, I, I know. that's. It, I feel like it's actually quite damaging to the mushrooms as well because we yeah. have to remember that they are spirits themselves. Mm -hmm. That's why there's so much folklore of them being connected to the wee folk and the fairy folk, yeah. you know, because they have their own identity, they have their own personalities through the land and they're wisdom keepers. So you yeah. take them in a car parking lot, 
at Chanel's 20th birthday party, they're not going to enjoy that, you know? Well, that was one of the things we were told in ayahuasca. It's just like, you know, the, the facilitators were saying like, oh yeah, we know someone who had a bad time and we asked them like, oh, why did you have a bad time in ayahuasca? They're like, well, I don't know. I did it in a hotel room in Mexico oh, City. And it's like, what? Oh, God. Like, of course you had a bad time. I can just see like the Mother Earth, like the spiritual ayahuasca moment yeah. being like, oh, why do we bother with the humans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, and I think this again, it, everything comes down to respect. Yeah. If you respect the mushroom, you respect the environment you're gonna have an amazing time that's exactly it uh, yeah. and this is one of the big things uh, in environments if I ever do them with people like one of the big things is like no alcohol you yeah. know alcohol is such a disrespect to the mushroom medicine yeah 100% uh, and you can almost see it if someone mixes alcohol with mushrooms like it, it, it turns evil yeah it corrupts the mushroom and they yeah. and if, like, for some reason some people think it, it like it heightens the experience yeah it's like no it, it corrupts the experience totally agree with that and there's something as well about setting appropriate intentions, clear yeah. intentions. I've, I've done ayahuasca three times, uh, not in the UK. The police can't come. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, oh, I miss my, are you doing ayahuasca in there? <laughs> time to hide in the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> they can't find me in here. <laughs> but, in tr truly, what happened was the first time I had a very deep intention to heal a lot of kind of like ancestral stuff. And I was very clear with Ayahuasca and her spirit that I wanted to work with her as an ally. As, a, as an ally. Mm. I said that and went Australian then. Crikey. Crikey, mate. <laughs> but the second time was when I was doing shamanic training and it was part of like, okay, we're going to throw you in the deep end with plant medicines and see if you can, you know, pull information from the spirit realm. And... Um, I almost remember like the experience of her arriving in my system and coming to me as this blue woman. A lot of people see her as a blue woman or a blue mm. snake. And her coming to me and being like, why have you come to my door this time? Didn't we do the work before? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm just here to learn. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, and I remember not knowing in that moment and she completely hammered me throughout. It was a really messy journey. Mm. And I feel like there was something about that, about... What I got from that experience was the, the importance of honoring her, of being mm. very clear, like I have come to your door with this very clear intention to work with you, and yeah. this is what it is. Because without it, she's just like, <laughs> like yeah. why are you here? Why are you wasting my time? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> she's a fierce mother. You yeah, know? well, I had a very similar experience recently with the tobacco spirit. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, one of the things I'm doing here in Glastonbury is just really reflecting on spiritual uh, spiritualness. I have a lot of editing mm. to do, so that's what I'm doing with work, but... Um, as far as like what I'm doing for myself is just really meditating a lot, doing a lot of yoga, going to the white springs, doing cold plunges, like trying to do whatever I can. I've done it. I did it again. So uh, brave. I, I doubled my time this time. Yeah, oh. It was good. I mean, I didn't do it today because we were meeting uh, and I didn't want to fall asleep because it happened again. I got so sleepy afterwards. <laughs> I was like, uh. Uh, but one of the things I did was like a trance journey just with drum beats mm. and I wanted to commune with the tobacco spirit. Uh, because it's hop I've been doing hop more, so I feel like I need to build this spiritual relationship with it. Yeah. Uh, and when I first approach the spirit, um, normally in like the spirit journeys, you know, you kind of approach a being, you kind of ask it questions. But this time, it didn't want to talk to me. And mm. so what I had to do was create a space for it. Um, and so I created like this kind of sacred space within the vision, and then the tobacco spirit came and joined me. Uh, oh wow. And I, I talked with the tobacco spirit. And one of the things that was very aggressive is was kind of like, why are you here? Yeah. And I was like, because I want to uh, like work with this medicine more. And like the first thing was, well, do you grow it? And oh, I was like, wow. You I was like, well, no. And it was like, <laughs> well, come back to me when you grow it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right. It was very clear. Now, I was able to get a few more answers, but um, it was very clear. Like, if you want to understand this medicine, the you, first thing you do is you have to grow it. To give back. Yeah. It's that thing of not extracting. Yeah. Giving back as much as we take. Yeah, yeah, keeping the earth sustainable, beautiful. It's so incredible that they, those messages, they, they're, they're able to communicate and come through so strongly mm -hmm. to teach us, you know. Yeah. It is a humbling it's experience. very direct, I feel. Very direct. <laughs> like, I, I very yeah. rarely have an ambiguous, like sometimes ambiguous, obviously, yeah. but like a lot of the times when I've had really good visions, uh, and mind you, these are mostly non-psychedelic visions. Uh, this yeah. is mostly through trance-inducing visions. And I ask these questions, I kind of get smacked almost like, you already knew the answer. Like, you yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. And that could be a lot of it. Like, you know, to people don't necessarily believe in the spiritual side, sometimes, you know, people see shamanism and trance states as just accessing another part of yourself. Mm. And so, you know, yeah, sometimes I think you might already know the answer. Yeah. And you have these beings telling you, like, you already know it. Why, you, why do you need me to tell you Dummy. that? Dummy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go home and do your research. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I get scolded a lot. 
It's fair. I like that they're not so fluffy up there in that realm, in the other world realm. Yeah, we're too fluffy here. It does reflect the kind of the folklore. They're often quite gnarly characters, mm -hmm. the Tua de Danan, like they're very, very gnarly, the, the Celtic Irish gods. You know, there's no mucking around. They're straight up yeah. fierce mofos. <laughs> yeah, there's no mucking about with them. If I had superior editing abilities, when you say mofos, I would like put sunglasses on you. <laughs> <laughs> Please do that. <laughs> they would just come down. <laughs> <Mofos. laughs> <Wicca, wicca. laughs> um, yeah, so I do want us to talk about, even though I think, I'm trying to see how much time we've uh, been doing this, but uh, can you Ooh, see? Oh, over an hour. Over an hour already. So I do yeah. think it's important that we do share kind of our experience with it. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that'd be good for people interested in it. Um, so yeah, uh, let's start with you. What is your, what kind of like led you down this path, and like, what's your experience been like with it? With kind of shamanic experiences yeah, yeah. themselves. So I think a lot of it was about. It's all mushrooms. <laughs> it's not all mushrooms. Oh my goodness! In fact, I think a lot of it began in childhood, because we were. I think we have so much more access to these states in in those times before we're told. It's in our heads, it's our imaginations, and we're kind of shut down. Imaginary friends. But yeah, there is something to these imaginary friends. I remember talking to elementals in the garden. I remember having that connection to the earth. And I think as I grew older, I, I kind of was always aware of those memories. And I, maybe out of nostalgia, kept following the threads of that. Mm. Um, but particularly in lockdown, I had a significant sort of moment where I really broke through with that where there was just so much time in nature, wasn't there? Mm. You know, you were either stuck in your house or you were on a dog walk. <laughs> <laughs> and I was on a very long dog walk, normally for 12 hours a day <laughs> in nature. That seems government approved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the loophole. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're doing plant medicine and walking dog for 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's these, I think there's this sort of, a, there's a moment of really tuning into the earth. I think a lot of people experience this of really like connecting back to nature, the flowers, working with natural medicines again, and being able to go so quiet in our heads that we could hear the ancestors. Mm. Um, and from there, I remember, I mean, a lot kicked off obviously moving to Glastonbury because you're suddenly in this kind of shamanic culture, if you will. Everybody's accessing some sort of states or exploring some sort of pantheon here. Um, but truly through my coven, through the women, um, through the womb, actually, I would have to say is my most shamanic experience. Mm. Um, when I'm uh, bleeding and there's this ability to access a portal and lots of women will talk about this, um, you know, rather than pushing away pain or taking a paracetamol, what happens when you go towards the pain? Mm. Um, and once I'd made my drum, actually, let me show you her. She's so beautiful. And this is one that I made with... Um, a local wise woman we have in our area called Dory Joy. Check her out, she's incredible. Um, she does a lot of drum birthing. And uh, the whole coven went along and we all made our drums together. And once we had our drums, that was it. We were accessing deep shamanic states, mm. completely sober, especially if we were bleeding. That feeling of going into that pain portal and then accessing altered states whilst drumming in front of the womb. Yeah. And in those, I, I can, I mean, I mean, we're talking about plant medicines. This doesn't even compare. I've had experiences that have been so psychedelic, completely sober. Yeah. You know, um, which I, I think I would call my most shamanic moments where mm. I've kind of encountered my ancestors on the other side and they've handed wisdom over to me. Yeah. Or, you know, I've had visions of something that's come true. Um, or I've been instructed how to make a certain tincture and then I've made it and it's turned out to be the exact thing intuitively that I needed to heal some part of myself. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's just beautiful. Sometimes yeah. you can just access those deep states and through sound weaving. Sound weaving as a tribe has been very powerful here. We sometimes explore it in groups mm. at the bottom of the tour in the White Springs here. Yeah. This, this kind of all tuning into an inner harmony, harmonizing with each other and then it's, it's the strangest experience of like, yeah, opening up a portal, a sound portal where healing can come through and releases can be given back to the ether. Um, but we, yeah, I do so much of that in my retreat. So I'm really yeah. excited to be exploring that with <laughs> shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me yeah. more about this retreat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, so those are the real moments, I think. Those yeah. really sacred moments. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. in general, 
I kind of like what you said, a lot of my most profound moments with uh, the spirit work has been uh, off psychedelics. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think psychedelics have a, a tendency to take you for a ride. Yeah. It's very difficult to kind of steer the ship. Yep. Uh, sometimes you can a little bit, uh, you know, you stroke the furry wall, but <laughs> uh, very much so it's going to take you on the journey it's going to take you on. Yeah. And you're yeah. just kind of along for the ride. Whereas you have a little bit more control in my experience with uh, shamanic uh, chanting or dance or drumming or journeys. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to connect to it. And, uh, and psychedelics just being one of those vessels uh, and, and one of those mm. techniques. Um, like something I really want to get more into is shamanic dance, uh, oh, trance yeah. dance. Oh, I know, we haven't even covered that, have we? That's a whole other thing. I know, there's so many other things. Uh, yeah. And I know there's one, there's like a few here that are like shamanic dancing. Yeah. Uh, so I know that's something I want to do while I'm here. There's one, I yeah. think, on the ninth or something like that, uh, I really want to do. They call it dance medicine here, where dance you medicine. just sort of dance yourself into dance a dance more. Thing. And you can meet some dance, 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 dance more. How serious you went there. Look at this face. He's I serious. hate, like, one of the things that pisses me off is everyone getting into paganism and not dancing. Yeah. Dance. Oh, my God. Our ancestors would totally have stomped on the ground. They would have danced, danced and, and sang. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think yeah. we're so self-aware these days and so self-absorbed that we don't yeah. want to look stupid. Everyone yeah. looks stupid dancing besides, like, professionals. Just dance. Dance. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, you know? just have a good time, and uh, and and the more research I do, you know, especially coming from the Norse, like the macho Viking mm. bros, you know, it's like you know, ah, Ragnar Lofbrok, <laughs> and then you actually look into like paganism, and it's a bunch of hippies dancing around a fire. Yeah. Yeah, celebrating the the moon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like that's what, what, what paganism is. What fine evening could one ask for? Yeah, that sounds awesome. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's something to that, isn't there? It's that collective uh, hysteria that accesses these beautiful states, you know through dance and often I don't know if you've experienced this but meeting um, parts of yourself different parts of yourself at different ages when you're dancing I've almost like had mm. a in my head been having a disco with like teenage me and childhood me mm. and little parts that just need more love I think uh, the the closest experience I have to that is like climbing trees okay I find climbing trees to be very like uh, takes you back. yeah it takes you back because mm. it, it feels like that's one of the things you're, you're told as an adult you, you shouldn't do anymore yeah uh, you know you never see adults in trees you I know, know, how tragic is that? Yeah, right. And like, you know, just the other day, I was like, I'm going to climb this tree. And, you know, it's like, I am the only adult in this entire park in a tree right now. And you know what? Every adult should be in a tree in this park. Like, you, you know. You should go up in the tree and take a trumpet. <laughs> and announce <Ooh>. it. <laughs> yeah, especially with the Scots. Yeah, I had like a horn like. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. trees are attacking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, the Scots, they probably have some like ancestral memory of the Vikings raiding. So they're all like. Ah! Okay. You know? <laughs> people on edge. There are so many stories of the Vikings raiding. I did oh, not realize yeah. how much Scotland got raided by the Vikings. Oh, it was God. a lot. Yeah, they were busy, the Vikings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, everyone talks about it in England, but like they were up in Scotland for like two or three hundred years. Like yeah. just raiding. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, one, yes. one of the things, another shameless plug for me, but in the video uh, I have coming up, one of the, the stories we talk about is this, uh, this valley, this loch in Scotland, uh, where the, uh, the Fiennan, Mm. So like Ben McCool yeah, and his yeah. group were throwing boulders at Vikings coming to raid and this stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, and there's like this big mountain and these like trenches and they're like, yeah, those are the trenches that the Fionnian were hiding as and they were throwing the boulders. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there's lots of really cool stories like that in Scotland, which is why I love it. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I was kind of called to, to talk about in uh, what you were saying is this kind of idea, again, with this terminology, is not everyone should be a shaman. Uh, not everyone is necessarily suited or called to be the healer yeah but everyone is healing and i think exactly. that's a oh, big distinction that's a really good way of putting it actually yeah. yeah absolutely space holding is a really serious thing it's difficult it's a really really serious thing and it needs to be done really well and really carefully and safely um but yeah that's i, I think that's a beautiful thing the whole world could do with tapping into shamanic practices yeah. in order to heal that is totally what's required yeah because yeah. uh, you know it's like you know, we talk about these things and people might be intimidated listening like, oh, that's not really for me. I don't want to be a shaman. Like, you don't have to be a shaman to dance, to sing, to play a drum. Like, these are not things you have to be a shaman to do. Now, when it comes to things such as, like, healing, like, actually, like, you know, guiding people through, like, past life regressions and traumas and stuff mm. like that. These are really big. Like, you hear a lot of, like, a lot of very, I feel like it kind of goes spirit animal, ancestral connection, 
past life regression and trauma healing and then all of a sudden we're removing your curses like it kind of like <laughs> escalates very quickly in the healing work yeah. uh you know i'm not you know i've been doing this work for a while and i feel comfortable with doing some of that mm -hmm. but all of a sudden you start like i have a curse that's been here since the 1620s i'm like that is not something i can handle <laughs> 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 uh, and so there's definitely kind of like tiers of knowledge. And, and the way yeah. I think I, I describe it even in my like posting for my shamanic retreat is I have a tool belt. Yeah. And I, I've been kind of researching this stuff. And I have stuff that I feel very comfortable doing, like spirit animal workshops and, and things like that. But yeah, if you come up to me and you're like, I have a curse, I'm going to be like, that sucks, dude. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I can't help you. Uh, whereas I feel like there is this kind of like this perception that all shaman, once you're, you know, you're shaman, like you're just a shaman. You can do everything. Mm. Uh, but there's layers to shamanism and, and not every shaman can do everything. Um, and also there's something, it almost parallels in some aspects to being a therapist. Like my mm. background training is therapy. Mm. Um, so as I trained as a therapist and you learn how to space hold and all of these things then, but ultimately you learn that you're not, in it to rescue people mm. that's not the end goal the end goal is to help people to rescue themselves mm. and that's the true um gold hidden within magicians and shamans and therapists i think there's a the, there is a correlation and a thread that runs mm. through that of you know whether it be through a ritual or you know some sort of metaphor that can induce a healing state where somebody actually steps into empowerment for themselves mm. yeah that's that's true healing when that that takes yeah. place yeah, for sure. Well, it's interesting because, you know, when you think about it, it's like shamans probably were, or, you know, whoever the shaman role was in a society. Yeah. Probably were the therapists. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, uh, they were, you know. Yeah, exactly. uh, And, and I, I find that the more shamanic techniques I learn, a lot of them are very parallel to, like, therapy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like, I know one, uh, it's called, like, the stone oracle. The stone oracle? What's that? It's where you have someone, like, select a stone, like, the size of the palm of their hand. Yeah. And then they have, like, a question, like, you know, how do I find love? And you're like, okay. And you, like, write it down on a piece of paper. How do I find love? And then you have them look at the stone and, like, talk about the stone. And then eventually they start talking about, their, like, their problems yeah. by looking at the stone. Yeah, and you just yeah. write it down. And eventually they answer their own question. Oh, absolutely. The wisdom is always hidden within everyone, isn't it? Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. That is the, the holy grail, really. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah, so a lot of the times, like, you know, like, like you said, you're not necessarily doing the healing for someone. You're just getting them in the right space where they can heal themselves. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I, I kind of um, had this, like, I don't know about you, but especially, this is maybe something that's good for psychedelics. Mm. But the way you visualize things changes. Yeah. Like, or, like, you, how you visualize a conversation. And I think is one of the things I've noticed the more I've kind of done this work. And I, I almost feel it when you can see someone's, like, I know exactly what's wrong with you, but that problem's, like, over here. And they're, like, yeah. over here, and you're like, okay how do we get them from there to there? <laughs> and you just have yeah. to like say the right things. Like you can't drag them to that point and be like, here's your problems. Yeah. You have to be yeah. like, okay, let's talk about your mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're a little closer now. Let's talk about your dad. <laughs> you know, and by the time we've gone through all their family, they're like really close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's totally about, I think that's a Socratic method as well. Socrates came up with that. Yeah. Of like asking the right questions so that people get to the gold within themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it works. Yeah, because yeah, like, uh, you know, I, I like I know the techniques and, you know, I went to Ecuador. One of the things the shaman said to me you know, when I was talking to them about these problems, they're like, well, how's your relationship with your mother? And I was like, oh, my mother. Oh, my mother. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know what they, you know, they asked the most basic question, but it like unlocked all this stuff. I just needed someone to damn ask me, like, how's my relationship with my mom? <laughs> Like, wow. that doesn't necessarily have to be a spiritual thing. It's just yeah. someone asking me how's my relationship I guess it's a 50-50, right? They can't go wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one is it? They just kind of look at you like... So your mom or your dad? <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> hmm. Oh, hmm. trying to read me. Yeah. Well, I know you too well, so... <laughs> <laughs> I would say if you probably have more mom issues. Interesting. Yeah. You know what, actually, I've done a lot of work healing my, my mama and my papa wounds. Okay, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Come both. Out the, come, out the other side, <laughs> come out the other side gracefully. I'm really close with my family now. But, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it took, it took a few rounds of therapy. Yeah. Well, you know, it's really... Uh, like, There's no rule book, though, for parenting. This is the ultimate thing I came yeah. to. I was like, God, yeah, it must be really hard being a parent. It's so easy to get it wrong. Um, I'm sure we'll be the same when we're parents yeah. one day, like well, flailing in the abyss just, trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. It's just crazy how many people's problems are caused by parenting, though. Yeah. Uh, like, the more I've done this work and the more I've met people and heard stories, like, a lot of things come from ancestral and family trauma. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we were talking about how incredible, it, you know, just the other day that we're the first generation to be allowed to talk about our feelings, to, mm. for it to be normalized to go to therapy, 
to have access to these kind of shamanic retreats and rituals. Yeah. You know, and we're not fighting like a war on our doorstep. Yeah. Like like our World War Two or World War One ancestors. War were. still exists. We recognize that. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're we not recognize bypassing that. war. But it's it's not World War Two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah like, uh, um, so we have that chance yeah. to be with our feelings and to be present. And I think maybe that in itself is going to bring up these shamanic aspects. We are going to be back in touch with these ancestral parts of ourselves mm. where we have the time to get to know the old gods again and yeah. to heal these wounds. Well, and I think we have a time unlike our ancestors as well. And that's something yeah. I reflect on a lot is like, while they didn't have the distractions, yeah. they didn't have to think about the rest of the world. They only had to think about what was within their vision. Yeah. Uh, and they weren't distracted by screens and technology. And so, of course, it was easier for them to connect with the divine powers. Yeah. Uh, but we have the ability to connect with the world, to talk with people, for this podcast to exist, for us to record on my strange little yeah. alien camera and share with the world our thoughts on, on shamanism, uh, yeah. a global practice now. Um, yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, what a time to be alive. Yeah, you know, really I know beautiful. a lot of people are very anti-technology, especially in pagan communities. But I'm very excited about 50, 50. it. I'm pretty excited 50, 50. about it. Like, <laughs> are the old gods going to return through AI? Is there going to be a plot twist that we never saw coming? This is tin hat material. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just ready for the next solo player, man. That's all. <laughs> but it is so cool we can yeah. connect like this, like with yeah. all of you around the world, you know? That's incredible, right? Yeah, yeah. and I think, well, and that's, uh, again, something I'm surprised we haven't mentioned, which is just gratitude. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just the core of a lot of shamanic practices, just being grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, being grateful for this conversation for Zorro and uh, <laughs> I thought that was a noise he made <laughs> uh, and being grateful for all of you um, I think if, if I think if I have any final moments uh, or final thoughts because we've been rambling on for a while now is a meditation I do on gratitude um, mm. and it's something you can do just with this you know a cup of coffee is you do this you know you can do this every day I try to do it at least once a week is you sit here and you take any object basically in your house uh, because every object is so affected by so many different lives now. And you sit here and you try to think of every human life that touched this to get it here. Oh, And you'd be grateful beautiful. for all those people. So you sit here and you're like, okay, who grew the beans? Okay, I'm thankful for the growers of the beans. I'm thankful for the beans. I'm thankful for the harvesters. I'm thankful for the roasters. I'm thankful for the boat that got the beans to me here in England. Yeah. I'm thankful for the people that built that boat, for the people that made that fuel, for the dinosaurs that became that fuel, you know? <laughs> And it doesn't take long before all of a sudden you realize that there are like thousands of lives that we should be thankful for yeah. to get this cup of coffee here. Yeah. Um, and that's oh, not something that. we think about all the time. That's so gorgeous. I totally, I'm going to adopt that. That's yeah. a really good and it's practice. it's mad because that's not how our ancestors lived. Yeah. If they, the shirt they were wearing, they, the lives affected by that shirt were like three. Who killed the animal or harvested the plant? Yeah. Who made it and who gave it to me? Yeah. And now, and now, like, <laughs> how many lives were affected making the shirt? Yeah. Countless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, it's mind-blowing, isn't it? Yeah. That's the world we live in now. We should live in a world of more gratitude. Absolutely. That's my final thoughts. Love that. Mm. What are your final thoughts? Yeah, I think very much the same. Yeah. Like, a grateful heart is a glowing heart is a growing heart, you know? It's uh, totally the way to access more beauty and, and more spirit and to invoke more joy in your life. It's... Uh, could there be anything more finer than that? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, that, that to me is the first step of healing, is just being grateful. Yeah. Yeah, and then seeing what comes after that. So I wish everyone the best on their healing journey. We're all on it. Yeah. We're all just in different stages. That's important to remember as well. You know, everybody's on the journey. We're all in it together, folks. Yeah. Buckle up. Yeah. Cry, <laughs> dance, sing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Live. <laughs> <laughs> All of the best. And things. none of us are perfect. You're not perfect. We're not perfect. Be Zorro imperfect. Is, but... Yes. Besides yeah. the gangly toe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gangly toe. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I could go on and on about this stuff because, like, I think that's one of the most beautiful things to it about as well. Is just it makes you feel so like more of a part of the greater whole yeah. and less of this like mind vessel. Yeah. Of just like, oh, I am just a little alien in a mind, a human meat suit. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, I'm part of this greater ecosystem. I'm yeah. part of the trees. I'm part of, you know, the, the humanity. And I think yeah. a lot of that understanding has come from this, uh, the spiritual, the spiritual work. Absolutely. Oh. So hopefully we've blown your heads off suitably with enough food for thought there to last until next month. <laughs> in our 80 minute video. <laughs> oh my God. Um, we will be putting our links to our retreats down below. Yep. If you fancy coming along, it'd be great to see you there. Um, and yeah, wishing everyone a beautiful spring. 
Dance more. Dance more.